the first poem is kind of a joke, you know, Ixbe um, and I, and it's partly in Pig Latin and partly in bird and a little bit of English. Bird? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Amy Shimshon Santo, uh, to Poetry LA. Uh, thank you for saying yes to uh, nerding out with me this afternoon oh, and being in conversation, uh, exploration, excavation, and also mm -hmm. we're definitely going to be in similar spaces of emotions with like love, anger, frustration, and hope. <laughs> Uh, as, so I'm super excited uh, that you said yes to this, um, oh. and even even more so excited about your new collection um, and it's Random Experiences of Bioluminescence by Flower Song Press. Press mates once again, I'm so, you know, again, I'm It's excited. actually it's almost that title, but a little bit different. Okay. It's Random Experiments. And you said experiences. Oh, okay. That's, and it's I didn't very similar, but I love that you're saying that because That's, it is random experiences. It is. It, but they're ex also experiments in trying to live in a time of such great shadow, great mm. suffering, great yeah. disorientation, and somehow have the experience of finding your own light. So your accidental word was actually to the soul of the book. Let's talk about the cover, you know, really quickly because it is absolutely gorgeous. The wonderful image on the cover is by a friend of mine named Pao Chutijira Wong. I met her in the mountains, in the Blue Ridge Mountains, at an, in an artist residency oh, space cool. in Haymage Center. And she was doing these tiny little uh, cyanotypes of mm. insects. And I love to work with visual artists in my right. books. And so I gave her the photographs that Bobby Gordon had taken of me when he was shooting us dancing in mm. the park for another project. And we started to play together when it, um, color, who should be in the right. frame. So I did the um, text, but the imagery and the world she created is pow all the way through. Oh, she did a fabulous job. Yeah. I love it. Before we get into the book, I want you know to, to ask you a couple of questions, just sure. to also introduce our audience to, to who you are. Uh, and I want to talk about your relationship with writing. Mm -hmm. Has it been a contentious relationship? Has it been a nur you know, uh, nourishing one? Mm -hmm. How would you describe it? I write in different ways, and my relationship to all writing isn't the same. Mm -hmm. My relationship to poetry is absolutely to save my life. Mm -hmm. um, it's something I've always done as a kid to have a, an honest space with myself to listen in. And I'm the kind of person who got involved with lots of different things in the world, and I often lost myself along the way. So for me, poetry has always been um, a guiding light. Is that terrible? It's a, no. it's a lighthouse in my life. Uh, but I never shared it with anyone else until one friend of mine once actually said, you know, your, all of your work, your poems are going to die in your laptop. Mm. And he, he compared me with, with um, the idea of um, a dream deferred, Langston Hughes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I thought, well, that kind of sucks. But how does a single mother raising kids doing community work ever have a time to really sit down and make your poems into something that could be shared professionally in publishing? So I'm really grateful for poetry. And when I can't write, I know it's because I'm dealing with something in the world that is really hard. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning more patience with that. But after doing a lot of community work and a lot of political work and teaching for 30 years and focusing on students and raising children, running a dance company, <laughs> all of these things, um, writing and poetry for me is a way to immediately say what needs to be said mm -hmm. and feel what needs to be felt without approval from a board of directors, a political official, a president, a governor, right. or anyone who has power over so many others. It's a way for me to feel in my own authenticity and my own power and to connect with people in their truth. Are there any artists or any poets uh, that you revisit? Well, I have a lot. I, I do have a lot of, we all do. Yeah. Uh, I remember once hearing someone say that 
he had relationships with all of these dead people in a library. And so I'm one of those two. I'm sure you are yeah. as well. Yeah. But uh, I have to say that the first poet I ever heard that made me think, that's a woman. I can be a woman, was absolutely Maya Angelou. And I heard her read at a party in San Francisco when I was a kid because we have wow. mutual friends of my parents. I was there as a kid with my, with my mom and dad, and she had just published in Still I Rise. And so wow. she pulls out her copy in her canvas pants and her head wrap and her whatever, and she read to us Phenomenal Woman. She sang it. When I heard her read, I was like, it's a good thing to be a woman. I can be a woman too. And so she was that first experience of that. That's one hell of an experience, right? first experience. <laughs> like if, that, if you're gonna get anyone to open that door for you, it's her and also to, to see her not, you know, to hear her read and then to sing and it to right. be live. And then yeah. and then if she had just published Still I Rise, I mean, talk about like a blueprint or, or yeah. someone setting the foundation. That's right. phenomenal. I mean, she definitely set an example of poetry is about being with all that your ancestors mm -hmm. brought forward in you, seeding something for the future, but also just being the author of your own life. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, we have to talk about the new collection <laughs> um, and a couple of questions. One, what was the impetus of this? Because catastrophic molting didn't come out too long ago. This was because mm -hmm. I remember being at your book launching. This right. was so this is, you know, catastrophic molting came out what two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago. I yeah. remember it very vividly. And then this new collection and um, I'm not going to say that one is better than the other because I don't believe in that. And I think they're just very different. They're I think different. there is no poetic hierarchy here, yeah. uh, you know, with your poetry. They're just very, like, laterally very different yes. uh, projects, different collections. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, comparing it to Catastrophic Molting, what was the impetus of this one? Like, what brought you to this one? Because this is such a polylingual yeah. book uh, or text. And, and my secondary question would be, how many languages are in are represented in this new collection? But first, what was the impetus of this one? Well, I'll just say before I forget, there are eleven languages. Okay, let's <laughs> see. They're not all me. They're also right. my friends. Right. These two books, actually, for a while, I wasn't sure what to do. There was catastrophic molting plus a little bit more, where I thought, how do I live in such a violent world? Where do I ground myself? Mm -hmm. I guess I'm going to ground myself with nature, right? Mm -hmm. And then I thought for a while, and the and, uh, publisher and I talked about this a lot, should this be a longer book or should this be two books? And I fretted over that a little bit. And then I decided, let it be two books. And that was absolutely the right move because there were more poems that wanted to come and they were related to the nature poems. Mm. And so it starts off with a sense of let me ground myself in habitat. Let me ground myself in the natural world. Um, it's, it's in relation to catastrophic molting because I had given up in a way on our species a little bit, to be honest. I wasn't happy with all of the violence and harm. And I was trying to belong to something, which has always been a bit of a struggle for me as a kind of from immigrant family where you're not taught anything about the Middle East or not very much about Jewish culture, and then marrying someone from Valle Brazil and creating kids, and you don't read about Afro-Latin culture either. So a lot of empty spaces. So the languages, first of all, came because it's just the reality of me. I remember once being at this event where a woman leader was standing up in front of this conference about health. And she did a little icebreaker where she had everyone stand up if you speak one language. Everyone stood up. Everyone uh, stay standing if you speak two languages and sit down if you only speak one. And a bunch of people in LA were still two languages. Mm -hmm. Then she said, okay, stay standing, remain standing if you speak three languages, and if not, sit down. And it was just me and one other woman on the other side of this gigantic conference room. And I thought, oh, everybody doesn't do this. I had never thought about it before. So it's my truth because my family lives in the United States, Canada, Uruguay, Middle East, and Brazil. 
That's that's very yeah. That's very, I mean, and that's just, <laughs> that is diverse in itself, and there's multiple languages, even multiple yeah. languages, multiple faiths. What we call racialization or cultures, multiple that, um, multiple politics. <laughs> Uh, definitely lots of languages. So what I realized at some point following the path of nature was that um, anywhere you go, there's more than one language mm -hmm. and there's more than two. There's many. If you think about it, like the birds, the first poem is kind of a joke, you know, um, and, I, and it's partly in pig Latin and partly in bird and a little bit of English. Bird? <laughs> yeah. There's, okay. <laughs> I mean, I can I read it for you. I, I remember reading it and going like, okay, I'm trying to wrap my head around this one, but you know, and there's a few, you. yeah, if you can read bird, I didn't know that bird. It's not a thing. It's and then I thought, a... should it be pajaro? Should it be bird? Or should it be tzipur? Because if you're just going to read it in bird, obviously bird is translated from bird into a human language. Birds probably don't call their language bird. No, they don't. I mean, if, no, I don't think <laughs> they would if they could, but they wouldn't no. if they could. Um, so it goes like this. I still listened to the ten tinsects and shed birds there. <laughs> How much fun did you have writing that? Hella. <laughs> Lots of fun. How much fun did you have? Yeah. It was actually, okay, so what started to happen this was. This is an onomatopoeia. I'm going to get nerdy and be like, this <laughs> onomatopoeia. Thank there's you, onom Pete. Yeah. Uh, there's onomatopoeia that, yeah. you know. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Please speak, I love what you have to say. Um, when I started bringing in the different languages, the computer started freaking out. Mm. And a lot of errors, and some of the poems like Shabbat Cryptogram, actually come from the computer messing up. Because when you start writing in multiple languages, you often need a different teclado, keyboard. You sometimes, you have to download it to your computer. And oftentimes you need another typeface. Oh. So the world technologically is not set up for us all to be reading each other, understanding each other, enjoying each other in that way. And I feel like that's the homework of now. Right. Um, so that poem was partly a mess up, right? <laughs> and I remember when we were editing the book, I'm like, what, what's the first poem you can put? And I had different poems as opening poems for this. And I said, you know, let me just go with play. Let me go with that mashup of different languages of real and not real. And let me make it big so the typeface is actually bigger than all the other poems. Um, yeah, because that's what, that's actually, it's a playful, serious book with lots of languages. And it's trying to hear the natural world, just it's multilingual, plurilingual, and multi species. Choosing the first poem of a collection is a thing. I mean, I try to tell people, it's like, hey, when, you know, you can write the poems, but then organizing the collection is its own work. So deciding what that first poem is going to be is quite quite important because it is going to be the first thing that people read. It is what, other than the cover, it is probably when people are over there at a bookstore, they'll go to the first poem, you know, and, and read it really quickly and be like, okay, can't, am I going to invest yep. in buying this book, right? It, does, it, does it grab my attention? It's almost like the trailer to a movie. Um, so that first poem was scary for me to choose because it's definitely playing. It's not serious. People will read it and they might not know how to read it. And they're like, is she going to confuse me the rest of this book? But I, I'm sure a lot of the book is, is a new experience. And that some of the books, you, some of the poems, you'll look at them and people will say, how would you even read that? Right. And that's partly why it has an orality archive. And it's partly why some of them are more cantorial. So you do write in, in this collection, we see the Villanelle, we right. see the haiku, yeah. um, we see poems written in a very, you know, typical structured, structured way, you know, um, starting on the left margin, things like that. And then you have <laughs> other poems that, you know, th you know what, what I like about it is that you use the entire page with some of the poems, right? Mm -hmm. Saviors of a Solitary Cycle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Saviors of a Solitary Cycle, Multiple Species, right? That, 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 that poem takes up the whole page. Yeah. Um, Garden of Letters, right, is, mm -hmm. uh, is like a nouveau abecedarian. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's your t I feel like it's your take on that form, but mm -hmm. kind of also doing your own thing with mm -hmm. it. And then uh, Marimba Chuva, or when I looked at it, I said, this looks like music 
like sheets of music <laughs> uh, and makes sense marimba right, right. so yeah. like the collection is experimental yeah. and it is playful and it wants the reader to play with them mm -hmm. that's how i took it you wanting things to be more structured or a little bit more um traditional you have given us the villanelle you've given us the haiku mm -hmm, as well mm -hmm. Um, actually, I would love for you to read uh, a Villanelle, if you may. Okay. Um, and you have one called Villanelle for, uh, I pronounce it Yemaya. Um, uh, and I just, uh, it's a selfish request because when I looked at that in your collection, I said, well, I have a pantoon for Yemaya. I saw. So, you know, there was that. There, That's an extension of our connection. Yes. So, uh, but I love what you wrote for her in your Villanelle. Um, yeah. If you could read it, that'd be lovely. It's in English and Spanish, and also um, Mazateco by the poet Gloria uh, Carrera. Gloria Carrera writes in um, southern Mexico, and during the pandemic, I was I had a lot of playdates with poets internationally on WhatsApp, and that was one of the translations that came out oh, of that experience. Awesome. I don't know how to read in Mazateco, but there is an orality archive with the book, and also there'll be an audio book so people can hear. Oh, Gloria awesome. read it in her own voice. Oh, that's voice. beautiful. What I'll do for now is I'll just toggle back and forth on the stanzas between English and Spanish. Perfect. So if you speak both languages, you'll understand all of it. And if you don't, you'll understand half of it. If that's OK? Yeah. Uh, one of the points, I think, of weaving in more languages is to be more authentic. A friend of mine, when I had read her um, Mixolydian, she started crying. Mm. And I thought, why is she crying? It's just a goofy poem. She said, I've spent so much time translating between my different communities. And you just used all your languages without having to translate. So this is a beyond mm. translation experience. And I thought, cool. Villanelle for Yemoja. Ocean holds all languages in her expansive reach. Dark silver nights or crab shell mornings, she connects every continent. Yo llego a pie, las gaviotas con alas. Nosotros comunan la fuente de cada sílaba. El mar abraza todos los idiomas en su alcance. Swirling emerald motion, seabirds hover, skitter on quick canudo legs. She connects every continent. Más allá, los pelicanos se deslizan por su superficie plana. Los leones marinos levantan la cabeza, tragan aire. El mar tiene todos los idiomas en su alcance expansivo. Curling waves become frothing foam. My body, a human form, aging in slow motion, mm. while the aquatic shapeshifter connects every continent. Agua conoce agua. Agado zero y sao con sao. Maremotos rolan, tumba, requetumba, elonga, el mar, Abraza todos los idiomas en su alcance. Ella conecta todos los continentes. Mm. And a little bit of Portuguese jumped in there. I know. I was <laughs> got those zeros. H dos zero. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I was listening and I was like, I know Spanish. And I was like, wait, that's not, I was like, I was like, that's something else. But I caught on to that and I understood that. So that was cero Portuguese, H2 cero Espanol. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank um, you. One of the most impressive sections of the, of the book is uh, you have a poem called What If I Were? Ugh. And it's one poem in 11 languages. Yeah. And that is, I mean, I was just so impressed by that. And it's a, it's towards the end of the book. I want to yeah. say it's almost like a, the second to last, right. uh, you know, mm -hmm. poem. Right. Um, but it's towards the end. And I just found it to be so impressive. Um, and just I, all I kept thinking, I was like, this is such a feat of a project that she took on. So I didn't seek out to translate it into 11 languages. OK. OK. I had been playing with friends who are also plurilingual. And so it becomes our nature, and we're poets. So we're like, hey, would you translate this into Ewe, or French, or Japanese, or Twi, or Otomi? And they're like, of course. So it was trying to naturalize our plurilingualism, mm. 
we already had the poem. So I'm like, if I'm putting in English and Spanish, why don't I just invite my mother? Why don't I invite Hashel from the United Arab Emirates? Why don't I invite, you know, right. Abena from, from Accra? And that's how it became 11. I would love for you to close out um, our time with uh, location. <laughs> the location of worms. <laughs> so this poem, uh, this is the scratch pad poem version, but it was inspired by the Akdamut. The structure is many, many thousands of years old. On the left-hand column was the first and last letter of the alphabet. It would be as if you were to say in the left-hand column, A-Z, 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 A-Z. Then in the middle, there were prayers. And what I did is I messed with it. I played with it. So in my poem, it has Aleph Tav, Aleph Tav, Aleph Tav, Aleph Tav on what side, which is equivalent in the Hebrew letters of A-Z, 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 A-Z. And then it has the Aleph Bait on the other side, which um, I'm still reeler. I'm still learning. That's how much of a beginner's mind I've had to have with this work, even though it's the right work. So the location of worms is obviously all of us on planet Earth, but the person who wrote the Akdamut, many painted the painting of the Akdamut, um, which is an image that's associated with the harvest mm. in spring. Um, uh, I hope he doesn't mind. So when I first showed this poem to friends, they said, how would you read it? And that's been part of the, the challenge of this, this collection is, okay, so you're following an ancient form in a different language and people don't all read it, so how are you actually going to speak it? And it goes something like this. The location of worms after the Akdamut. Ta, 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 Aleph, Beit. Gimel, Dalit, He, Vav, Zain, Chet, Tet, Yud, Ta, 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 Kaf, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Mem, Sofit, Nun, Nun, Sofit, Samech, Ein, Pe, Pe, Sofit, Fe, Fe, Sadik, Kuf, 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 Ta, 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 Resh, Shin, Tav, Ta, Ta, Ta. Praise unceasingly, ta, 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 ta. Almost an intelligible oneness, ta, ta, ta. All ages walking, crawling, sometimes running, sleeping on the wings of all kinds, ta, 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 ta. Starting with the angels of eggplant, hummus and shakshuka, ta, ta, ta. The angels of rest, ta, ta, ta. Severe abandonment of form, ta. Calendar year of praise, ta. Rising up and down in all directions, ta, ta, ta. Praise for good deeds, ta, ta. Be strong and courageous, ta, 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 ta. Prayers for praise itself, ta, ta, ta. Birds sung praises, pe beaut of praise, ta. Ta. And even in the location of worms, a woman could raise herself ta, ta, in sound and form, singing with the alphabet ta, until there was only quiet. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. Yeah, I couldn't read it that way. <laughs>